Uh, okay, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this uh, virtual talk. I'm not sure I've talked to the, uh, more than 100 people virtually before, so uh, this will be an interesting uh, challenge for me. Uh, so I'm an emergency medicine uh, consultant uh, based in the UK in a, in a city called Sheffield, and I'll show you a bit of our geography. I noticed there are some uh, friends from outside of uh, the UK. Uh, so anyway, so what I've been asked to, to do for you today is to basically give you like an introduction to uh, ultrasound in emergency care. The, the word that we like to use uh, in, in the way we use ultrasound is, is basically point of care ultrasound or POCUS. Um, some people say it's hocus pocus, uh, but really what we are trying to often answer are simple questions, uh, a binary question as in yes or no, is there fluid? Yes or no, is there a pneumothorax? Yes or no, and basically I'm going to try and hopefully do it a bit uh, with a bit of interaction from you or a bit of participation uh, from you. Um, so what the, the, I'm just going to give you a, a bit of an introduction and, and so there'll be a bit of basic uh, physics and ultrasound physics um, and hopefully it'll give you a taste of uh, ultrasound and possibly how you can use that in your area of practice, whether you are a paramedic, a physiotherapist, a nurse, uh, or a doctor. Um, th there is so much that point of care ultrasound uh, can do. Now, we're not. I'm not trying to train you to be um, an expert sonographer or an echocardiographer. By no means, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm none of that. But we just want to use that for a particular reason, really. Uh, so I just want to give you a bit of the geography of of uh, uh, where we are. Okay, so this is this is um, where Sheffield is, which is in the in the north of England. Uh, if I can get this to work, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, so this is the this is the north of England here, uh, and um, there we go. So our hospital is an adult only hospital uh, and we are a major trauma center for the region. And as uh, this uh, uh, Google Maps will eventually zoom out and show you, there is a neighboring hospital where our neurosurgeons live and that's at the Hallamshire Hospital and Ops and Gynae are there. But we cover a region of South Yorkshire um, uh, for any trauma patients that come to us. Uh, we are also a referral unit for uh, cardiology and cardiothoracics um, and, and neurology as well. Um, so our, our population is about uh, 500,000 uh, 500, people, uh, five, about 550 now um, in a recent, uh, in a recent uh, census. Okay, so firstly, I'd like you to, for those of you who are watching it on your laptop or your iPad or something, and you've got your iPhone or your mobile device with you, if you could just scan this QR code and... I'm going to see whether we can switch this um, and see whether you can participate in this question. Yay, I can see eight, 11 participants typing. That's fantastic. ECA, so that's emergency care assistant for those of you who are outside the UK, operating depart department practitioner and ODP, A nurses, heart paramedic, paramedics, fantastic. Junior doctor. Emergency medical services physician. AAP, I, I presume that's an advanced practitioner of, of a sort. As a dinosaur, <laughs> dinosaur, thank you. So I see there's loads of uh, paramedics uh, around uh, uh, and a nurse from my own hospital. So uh, thank you for the support, <laughs> yeah, whoever you are. Brilliant. Okay. So uh, thank you. I know that some of you are still typing, but uh, we, you can see that we've got quite a big mix and the majority of people actually seem to be uh, paramedics. Uh, we still we have some uh, nurses, uh, um, allied health professionals, uh, but thank you. All right. Um, this was probably still run anyway. Uh, okay. So we're going to we're going to move on to the, the next question. Okay. Describe your ideal vacation using one of the emojis. Now, I, did, I, I thought searching for an emoji might be tricky. So I thought I'll give you, a uh, give you a multiple choice question, really, and let you select what you want. People love to travel. People love wine and <laughs> drinks. 
travel is the most popular. So ski holidays are down to number four now. Uh, for myself, I'm I'm quite a fan of uh, snow sports, uh, so that tends to be my my number one uh, number one choice. Uh, some of you have some of the above, some of the cycling, uh, some of the walking, running, but travel seems to be the most popular thing. That's fine. fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, we're going to move on a little bit, and uh, I just want to talk about the bread and butter of uh, what we do in in my emergency department. Now that can vary. Uh, depending on which department you're in. Uh, but I would say the majority of the time, our ultrasound machine is being used for hip fracture blocks and also for bladder volumes uh, whenever we've got someone with uh, cord equina and also vascular access. Uh, and then depending on the skill set on the on the shop floor, then uh, the, the four below uh, may or may, may not be used. But the top the top three uh, are what I would say would be the, mo the most popular in, in, my, in my department. Now, this is a paper that I'm just putting up, uh, which was published by um, uh, the people in uh, Massachusetts, the good people there. And they were looking at basically at uh, people who, uh, patients who were presented in their NMM, m and meetings, uh, and they wanted to see whether um, point of care ultrasound, POCUS, uh, whether it, would, it made a difference or whether uh, it was used uh, inappropriately. Okay, so interestingly, if you look at the bottom left here, it says here that if POCUS had been used, uh, is they would un is unlikely to have prevented uh, M and M. So it's very similar to if it was used or not used. The percentage is very similar. Okay, um, but I think what what's important to think about is in this next table from from the same paper, is this thing on the top right. Depending on whether your uh, my image is blocking the the right side of the window, but basically the the top right column is talking about when point of care ultrasound when POCUS was used inappropriately. And so what's it, this to me is really important is really is thinking about using it. You know, the nurses from my department or the doctor will tell you that I, I am a POCUS enthusiast, but I don't surprisingly, I don't have the machine next to me every, every, with every single patient. I consider when uh, when it's time to use it. Um, so that's a very important thing about POCUS. You don't use it in willy nilly. Uh, you want to think about when when you use it. Um, now, this this fellow, not many of you may recognize him. Uh, he is an American uh, software engineer by the name of uh, Grady Booch. Now, why why is he important? He came up with the phrase that a fool with a tool is still a fool. So, if you're a bad doctor, you're a bad paramedic, a, a crap nurse, a crap student, whatever you are, and you are not. Uh, if you are uh, not a good clinician at all. Having an ultrasound machine is not going to make you a better uh, clinician. Okay, so that's very important. To remember. Um, so I don't want to teach you to suck eggs, but I'm just going to go through some basic uh, ultrasound physics. Okay, so the first thing we know is sound waves um, uh, travel, and they tr can travel in all directions. But when it hits something, it it will come back towards you, and so that's the concept of reflection uh, for sound waves. So this is this is our uh, our probe here, and is hitting uh, some material, and in this case, it looks like a needle. And it's if it hits it at a right angle, then you know it comes back at ninety degrees. But if it goes off at a slightly different angle, then it won't come back towards the probe at the right place. And so what what then happens is the machine has to interpret this, okay? And sometimes we use this to our advantage. I won't go into in depth to the physics of what you see on the right hand side, but I'll tell you that this here is the diaphragm. What I'm color coloring in pink or purple and sound waves are coming off from the probe and they're actually hitting the liver and they're coming back this way in that direction and going back in that direction. And what makes and what happens is then the machine thinks that there is li liver over here. OK, so that's what we call a mirror image artifact. So that's why this bit here, this grayish material there, that's actually a reflection of the liver there. And we use that to our advantage. And when we do perform a scan like this, this is called a fast scan. And if we see a mirror image artifact, then we know that there's no fluid above the diaphragm. And I'll come into that in, in a while. But that's one basic concept about uh, reflection. Uh, uh, 
the next reflection uh, the next uh, thing we want to think about is um is this concept okay so if people um let's hope that let's hope this works now if you go into slido and you can tell me back on your slido thing what is wrong with this picture I'd agree actually for the 12% that this is inadequate fluid resuscitation, but yes, it's also not Guinness. So I think the top two answers uh, deserve uh, credit. Uh, well done for saying for 0% not answering that beer is not allowed in sunny weather. So that uh, top marks to all of you. Uh, but yes, uh, what's important here is that this is this is not Guinness. And what, what is Guinness? Guinness is black in color. And so in ultrasound, uh, you're gonna get when you have fluid, it's going to be an what we what we call an anechoic uh, image. It's is black basically, basically no echoes are there. Okay, so that's for fluid. Now this is me uh, after a shift, probably nothing to do at night. I've got an ultrasound machine in my office, and I'm just trying to uh, show you some another uh, artifact of physics. Okay, so on the left here is a, a cardiac probe, and this is a vomit bowl full of water. Not we, not vomit, just water. And I've got, and here is actually, this level here is where the probe is touching water, okay? And this is, I'm, I think this is actually probably over here, it's the bottom of the bowl, okay? And as I'm pushing down, you can see that there's some movement coming up here. And that, and you know that shouldn't be there, okay? But it is there on the ultrasound image, and that's what we call an artifact, something that shouldn't be there, but is there. And if you, the more you recognize and understand your physics, then we start to recognize um, artifacts. The more we understand physics, we understand, and then we see artifacts, and we can interpret what we see. So this is another, it's almost like a mirror, mirror image artifact. You can see lots of lines, and it's something we call a reverberation artifact. I, I'm sorry, to, I don't mean to give you know inundate you with terms, but this is important when we come to some of the images we see. So you know that this uh, this young lady is standing at one end of the lift, uh, taking an image of herself, but because of the, the way the mirrors are lined up, there's multiple images of her, which are not meant to be there really, but they are there, okay? And that's, that's something like what we see here is what we call a reverberation artifact. The probe is here, touching skin, and this is the true line and in this case it's probably the lung the lung what we call the plural line and everything every other line that you see down here these are all artifacts and what's happening is it's described in this image uh, on the right here where sound waves are hitting the probe hitting this bright plural line here and because it's hitting it at a high energy it's reflecting back and it reflects back and then it comes back down again. So in the end, the computer thinks that there are lots of lines down here, but they are not there. So all these lines here are actually not there. They are a reverberation artifact, but we can, as I said, use them to our advantage, okay? Right, so we're gonna do a bit of pick and mix and I'm gonna try and uh, attempt uh, to let you um, choose uh, the cases, okay? So we will come back. To, we'll come back to this image. Uh, we'll come back to that table, and and we'll come back to so that if you if you scroll down uh, on your phone, okay. I'm I'm gonna so you, we'll just see who would like to cho you choose whatever case you want, and then uh, I'll wait about 10, 10 seconds, and we'll let you we'll see which one we go for, and then we'll come back. Okay. All right. Moped versus car. So the moped versus car. Uh, I'll. So you, you guys can keep on voting while I while I while I chat. So this might change in terms of popularity, but we'll go with moped first as car first. Okay. So this was actually our most uh a most recent case. I think I was either on nights or I was on a late shift where um uh some of the northern general nurses may have remembered or heard this story. Uh, there are two lads on uh on a little on a scooter coming down a hill at, at speed. Now Sheffield is is um has seven hills okay and so there's lots of hills to descend at, at speed and there's two young lads one one 16 year old one 18 year old were coming down at speed wearing helmets but hit a parked car um so they when they when they when they arrived uh what sorry when the first lad arrived um they had prepped him they had intubated him 
and they were preparing to uh they were preparing him sorry i'm going to go i'm just going to go back they were preparing him to uh him to go to ct okay so intubation was fine uh saturations were all fine and then he um, just before he was going to go to ct he dropped his blood pressure um and so this is an image of a normal lung ultrasound okay so uh here and here are your rib shadows okay as depicted by this image here okay and you'll see if you can convince yourself here that uh, there are lines going back and forth and that we call that an army of ants uh, where where the arrow is pointing okay that army of ants and where the, and um if you see this which is what we call lung sliding then you know straight away that there's no pneumothorax okay so the image below is how we perform a lung ultrasound we put the probe in, in in a kind of like a vertical direction or what we call a longitudinal direction yeah and and the rib the rib here is the rib above and this is the rib below and we're looking at this plural line if we see lung sliding you know immediately there's no pneumothorax so this young lad had crashed just before he went to ct uh, I was actually with the, uh, the patient next door, but the ITU consultant had done uh, a lung ultrasound on one side, and there was absolutely no movement on in there. There was no lung sliding whatsoever. Uh, and you can see it. Uh, uh, so he had tension on the right side. So they put a, they did a thoracostomy, did a chest strain, and his blood pressure actually started to started to improve. So the left side is just a, a normal patient. Uh, is that first uh, that first image you saw uh, with the lung sliding there? Okay, so this is the same lad post chest strain insertion, and if you can convince yourself, um, so I've got a kind of moving but still image. You can convince yourself on this bit of the lung sliding, you can see some sliding. Yeah, okay. And what I'm going to do now is just going to get rid of these arrows. And if you look on this side, just slightly to the right of there, you can see that there is no lung sliding. And that is what we call the lung point, the point where a pneumothorax meets, uh, sorry, a normal lung and pneumothorax exists. So where you see lung sliding is normal lung. And then beyond that, where there's no slide, where there's no sliding at all is, is, a, is a pneumothorax. So his pneumothorax had improved. There was some sliding, but there's still some, he still has some residual pneumothorax, which is what we see. Uh, the thing is, he was still slightly hypotensive. So they asked me to, so I, 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 I came to the, the research, research area by this time, and they asked me to do an ultrasound to look at his other side of his lungs on his left side, and to look at his heart to see whether he had a cardiac tamponade. So, um, so, so where I'm putting a probe is on his left side now, and this is the left upper quadrant. This, this here is his spleen, okay? And remember I said uh, Guinness... Uh, fluid is black, uh, fluid is anechoic. If you can convince yourself, there's some areas of, of black here. All right. So I knew that above the diaphragm, he's got a hemothorax. Okay. Um, this is the image uh, early on the left hand side that tells you, that shows you that a mirror image artifact where you should see a, a mirror image of the liver or the spleen. And if you can, if you can see here where it's black, there's no mirror image. This, this whole area here is just a, a black area. Okay, that tells me there's fluid there. So we, we decided that, okay, we'll put another chest drain on, on his left side. Okay, um, there's a bit of floaty lung here at that corner there, uh, but you can still see just, just on the right of that uh, floaty lung that, that is black or anechoic, so there's fluid there. So we knew that we had a choice to put in a chest drain or not, uh, or wait for him to come back into chest drain. But we decided to put a second chest drain before we sent him for sent him to CT. And then this is my subcostal view of this fella to answer the question. Now remember, I said fluid is anechoic or black. So there's a there's a possibility of a slight amount here. Okay, but really, what you're trying to look for if there's significant pericardial effusion is fluid surrounding the whole heart. Okay, and um, I know it's not really deep enough here, but I can tell you for free, <laughs> there's there's no there's no uh, free fluid below that. So there wasn't a significant pericardial effusion. So I was happy that we didn't have to open up his chest. Uh, and lo and behold, we were right. We sent him for a CT and basically he had mainly chest wall injuries. Okay. Uh, right. So let's see whether this works. We're going to go back to the future. Uh, and we're going to go back to 
I'm going to go back to the poll. Focus cases. Okay, so somebody, so a few people have been choosing some other things now. So we've got a stab wound to the left anterior chest. So let's have a look at this. Um, some people are still ranking it, but we'll stick to left anterior chest for now. And then we'll come back to that in a while. So left anterior chest. Oh, lots of you like trauma, interestingly. So this, this was a case for uh, one of my colleagues, actually. Uh, a patient come in. Uh, one of my colleagues was leading the ultrasound, uh, sorry, leading the trauma. And uh, so there were two of us. So he, he asked me to do the primary survey. So oftentimes in my, in the ideal, because I'm a, a slightly biased, I would rather use the ultrasound machine as my primary survey instrument rather than use a stethoscope. I use it. I use uh, the ultrasound. So this guy had come in with a, a stab wound to his left chest. And um, initially, I did a lung ultrasound to look for a pneumothorax, and there was lung sliding, so that, that was normal. So this view is what we call a subcostal view. Uh, you can see here that um, the probe is, um, the probe marker is pointing to the patient's left, okay, and it's just under the xiphysternum. So on the image here on the right, uh, that's, that's um, the heart here, okay, and then this I'm going, I'm kind of going blind, but this, this area here, this is liver. Okay. This is a liver shadow. Uh, you can see the, you can see the, the beating heart here. And if you can convince yourself here, okay, that is an anechoic area. Okay. Where my line is, is anechoic, uh, i.e. is probably blood. Okay. And there's kind of material floating in there. So this guy, um, so I went on to do an, a, a this is a different view just to confirm it, and, and you can see that uh, really here the fluid is surrounding his heart. Okay, and one more thing that is significant is if you look here, this is his right ventricle, this this anechoic space, and if you look at the wall here, this is the right ventricular wall. It almost looks like it's dancing. Now I'm going to try and do that with my hand, but it looks like his hand, his right ventricle is doing this and flopping with diastole. And that tells us he's in tamponade, okay? So basically we, and because we knew he had only one single wound in his chest, uh, we decided that he should just go to cardiothoracic theater uh, pronto, uh, which is what we did. So he left, uh, he left recess uh, at eight minutes and 59 seconds. Uh, one of our trauma nurses got quite excited and took this picture. And that's why I have that image. Um, uh, initially, we posted it on Twitter, but we, we took it down uh, when, it, when it was first posted. Okay, right. We're going to go back to uh, the live poll and see where we are. Uh, so we've done the left anterior chest. Uh, not that I'm trying to direct anybody, but uh, it's all trauma. <laughs> uh, remember, you've got some others below you. I'm going to give it a few more minutes. Fine. All right. We're going to stick with stab wound, posterior chest, and then I'm going to go to fascia eyelid block. And then we may have to call it uh, uh, stop in terms of time. Okay. Uh, so, John, just keep, uh, just give me a prompt to prompt to if I've got like about five to five to seven minutes left. So we're going to go to stab wound left posterior chest. And I think this was a patient of a, a colleague of mine, a young 21-year-old male, single stab wound to his left chest and his left arm. And he comes in hypotensive. Um, so we do uh, his cool peripheries, his agitator on arrival. Uh, his blood pressure is 130 over 70, but he's tachycardic with a heart rate of 132. So we, we give him some O negative, uh, uh, the massive transfusion protocol. He's intubated. And then and then we do... Uh, we do of course, we do a lung ultrasound. Okay, so the first thing we do is put a probe on his chest to see what's happening. Okay, and if you can convince yourself uh, here, uh, I'm just going to use use the dot now. So this is the rib shadow on the left and on the right. So that's superior, inferior rib. Okay, and that's the pleural line. Okay, and if you just have a look, you there is movement because this guy is trying to breathe. He's working hard, he's breathing. 
but there is no army of ants crawling. There's no, there's no movement going up and down that way. Okay, and in fact, you see something called this reverberation artifact, and these are called A lines. Lots of lines there, and A lines mean either there's a pneumothorax or it can be normal, but it can be only normal if there is lung sliding. And in this case, there is no lung sliding. Okay, so this is this is normal lung again. Okay, where you've got, if you look here, you can see the lung sliding back and forth. Okay. Normal lung sliding, sliding back and forth. If you look here, lung sliding back and forth. And if you compare it to, so this is the norm, this is normal on the right. And on the left up here, if you look at this plural line, there is no movement. So we knew that this fella, that young gentleman had a pneumothorax. And when we put the probe down in his lower chest wall, uh, you'll be able, you can, I'm sure you can convince yourself this is anechoic, this is like the Guinness fluid. Yeah, no ultrasound there. So that is blood in the context of trauma. And his lung is collapsed, and that's why you've got this kind of appearance with lots of bright stuff in there. Basically, it's, that's a collapsed lung uh, with a pneumothorax. And that's his CT, eventually. And uh, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with CTs, uh, this here is fluid, okay? Uh, so we, which correlates with uh, the pneumothorax that we, that we saw. Uh, so I'm just go back to the. I'm just going to go back to the poll to see. Uh, oh yeah, vomiting Chinese and Wabian, right? Uh, I got a bit excited with this. Well, not excited. So basically, this this um, uh, this gentleman was in his seventies or possibly eighties, um, and he'd come in with a. To, to be fair, he came in with a classic presentation and story of someone with bowel obstruction. So not open his bowels for quite a few days, started vomiting, and it was quite thick and smelly, and he had a he had a big distended tummy. Okay, so clinically, I already knew what it was. And so I did the first thing first, I didn't scan him, I didn't do an ultrasound, so I didn't do an ultrasound scan, I sent him for a CT scan, because in, in our center, he meets the criteria for an emergency uh, CT abdomen. And that confirmed, uh, that confirmed uh, a bowel obstruction. So I thought, I, I read about and learned that, you know, there are certain appearances, um, uh, with a bowel, bowel obstruction, and we we term it poo and fro. <laughs> okay, uh, I, 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 know, I, I know it's a silent audience, so I'm just laughing at myself. But if you notice, if you look at poo, it's moving to and fro. Isn't that amazing? So this guy had, this is, these are the ultrasound findings for somebody uh, who has a bowel obstruction. Okay. Who improved. So what I'm for me, it was a learning thing. I was I, what I, is what I tell my trainees about negative and um, sorry, reverse engineering. Where if you know someone's got a pneumothorax and a chest X-ray, and you've never seen an ultrasound, put a probe on, get used to see what Epsom lung sliding looks like. So in this case, I wanted to see what uh, what Pumipro looked like. Okay. Um, okay. Shall we? Shall we just do one more? Uh, or possible? How are we doing for time, John? uh yeah we've got yeah you've got probably seven eight minutes seven eight minutes okay maybe two more cases so two more cases we do fascia eye block okay fascia eye block uh it's one of my fave things it's the one most uh high one of the most high value things that, that we do in in my in my a e for the patient so uh a fascia eyelid compartment block is a block that we use for patients with 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 hip fractures. Okay, uh, I know this looks like possibly gobbledygook to a lot of you, but this is the the anatomy of the muscles of what we're trying to aim for, and this is trying to simulate the needle. And this is a muscle called the eyelacus muscle. Uh, this is one of the muscles at the head end called internal oblique, the sartorius muscle, and there's this kind of bow tie appearance that my that I'm trying to teach my students to try and look for, although it's not necessarily uh, important. Now, so we've transformed at the Northern General our um, our pre-theatre blocks. Okay, so this is the National um, uh, uh, Fracture uh, Hip uh, National Hip Database Hip Fracture Database, and uh, if you this arrow that points up here, okay, that correlates to blocks that are given pre-theatre. Okay, so in twenty seventeen, in June twenty seventeen, nerve blocks pre-theatre. At the Northern General, we were at forty-four percent. Okay, 
And when we introduced uh, the fresh air block part, the our necrophemia pathway, and then started teaching people uh, ultrasound guided blocks, yes, you can do it with the, what we call the blind technique. But um, my my suggestion is it's better to see where you go rather than have a feel where you go. You know, it works for some things, feeling where you go, but in this case, sometimes it's better to look where you go. And you can see for us over the years, from from uh, from 2017 right up to end of last year, we've we've improved. And on average now, we're 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 at about 80 percent. Uh, we're at about oh, in fact, here is 93 percent in May of last year. But it, we vary between 80 85 to 90 93 percent. And uh, the national uh, uh, the national average here. You can see that we are doing a lot better uh, compared to the national average. So yay for for the northern general. But you know, it's something that you can bring into to your you can bring into your department. Um, okay, this is a video, and I don't know whether there's going to be music, but if there is, just bear with the music. But uh, this is a video I did to try and teach my juniors, and actually, uh, the video is me videoing my junior doing this the the block for the first time with me supervising. Okay, but he's doing the block for the first time. so i apologize for the music for those of you who, uh, i've been i was given some feedback that there was terrible music so uh but uh hey it makes me relax and i i, I like the i like the the tune uh, on the left is the bottom left is the QR code to uh, the video, which I've posted on uh, on YouTube, I think. Yeah, I think, yeah, I created my own channel uh, for some videos. Um, but uh, that's something that you can uh, use. You, you can use. Um, OK, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, I mean, we we can keep going on and on. So there's lots of cases that we can go on about. But I think what I'll do is I might leave it to um, just uh, summarize some things. And then if really we want to come back to some cases, we can. Or uh, I, it's probably more important that I, I start answering some questions that are out there. OK, so this this last bit of my my talk is about just thinking about the barriers, the barriers to uh, ultrasound and ultrasound education. So believe it or not, so there's, there's a paper that's been written. And again, it's been written um, uh, one. These are the big names in point of care ultrasound. Uh, Andrew Letaplo is based in Massachusetts. Uh, Ari Ma is, is based in, in Canada. And um, they were looking at intern, internal medicine uh, trainees uh, and they did a survey of what, really, what put them off, really. And in, in summary, in summary, the main five barriers are, uh, the, number one, they don't have a device. Uh, they don't have training, number two. Number three, there is no supervision. Four, this is a big thing, a lack of time. And then governance, a lack of quality assurance. Now each, and the, and the, the trouble is each center has a different way of doing things. Um, so my department, we're quite fortunate. We, we had to fight for it, but we, we have three, we have three uh, devices in, in our department. Uh, in fact, four, but one's, one's trying to die. Uh, training is still an issue, and you know I still haven't rolled out training for our nurses uh, and enough training for our advanced care practitioners. But you know it's because that's just one of me. So um, 
so at the moment, my priority, I've been, I've been fortunate enough to be given some time to supervise my uh, emergency medicine trainees. And it's just a matter, well, I have to negotiate more time to train our ACPs and our nurses. Um, so if anybody wants to do a fellow job with me and the Northern General, please do, you're welcome to come and have a chat with me. The lack of time, that, that's always a tricky thing. And so what, what we have for our trainees in emergency medicine is that they have a protected time. I, I forget what EDT stands for, but it's basically like, like extra time for, for training that they can go to a clinic or they can do a one-to-one -one session with me. And also in the ideal world is if you do a scan, then somebody reviews the scan that you've done. Uh, and again, I used to have time for that, but um, hey ho, uh, you know, there's only more important things in life than just working, working, and working. So what is this image uh, for? It's not to show you that I'm a Star Wars fan, but really you want to think about when you do ultrasound, that you want to have someone supervising you, you want to have a mentor to guide you, to give you word, words of wisdom in, what, in, in, in how to improve your image acquisition and how you should hold your probe, to give you some top tips and some, when, some, someone to give you feedback on, on the images that you're doing, okay? So, which leads me to ask, uh, I, I haven't been monitoring the questions, so I'll probably uh, hand over the time in the next minute or so to, to John. Uh, so, this is always one of those sad slides where I'm trying to tell people, do, if you want to follow me on uh, Instagram, that's there. So most of my pictures on Instagram are me snowboarding or trying to pretend to surf. My medical bits are here uh, uh, on the right where um, I, I, I tend to post on Twitter. And this is my Twitter handle is Casualties RS. The YouTube channel is a bit sparse because I take forever to edit videos, but I do try and put out some focus related videos and also just some uh, EM procedural uh, videos. Okay. Uh, so with that, for now, we have stopped at 8.47 in the evening. Uh, so I just want to thank you very much for your time.